Welcome once again to The Close Read. This is the Claremont Review of Books podcast. The CRB can be found online at claremontreviewofbooks.com, where you can also subscribe to get the print edition. And if you're interested in supporting us, uh, we always appreciate that at claremont.org slash donate. As our regular listeners No, this is the podcast on which every new issue of the CRB uh, gives me the opportunity to sit down with a few authors and explore more deeply the themes that are raised in their essays and perhaps also some of their other work, as is the case today. I'm, I'm really delighted to be joined once again, our first repeat performance on The Close Read um, by James Hankins. He's a professor of history at Harvard, which is uh, where he's joining us from today. And you can find his most recent book, wherever books are sold, it's called Virtue Politics, Soulcraft and Statecraft in Renaissance Italy. Uh, Professor Hankins, Jim, it's such a pleasure to have you back. Thanks for coming on. Yes, thanks for inviting me again. Great. Well, I'd like to sort of set this up for our listeners by notifying them both of a review that you have in in the latest CRB. It's called What Kind of Realism Toward China? But you've also written, uh, again, on China in American Affairs. Uh, He's called Regime Change with Chinese Characteristics. And I commend both of these pieces to our listeners. I think between the two of them, they sketch and, you know, inform a lot of Americans who would be otherwise unaware of these deep seated and um, really sort of political and social shifts in China that bear not only on Chinese history and and China's future, but also on our attitude toward China going forward. I'll just read a portion from the last paragraph, actually, of your CRB essay. And I think it kind of will act as a hinge into both of these, into both of these pieces. So you write, Although China is not about to evolve into a Western-style liberal democracy, there may be a middle way. Its most liberal political theorists hope for a kind of hybrid regime, mixing local democracy with a remoralized meritocracy at the higher levels of its central administration. They advocate a revival of Confucian Tian Sha, a model of international order in which a middle kingdom acts as a source of power and civilized values and allies itself with sympathetic states at its periphery against Yi or barbaric states. Much of the demonization of China in the West comes from the misguided view that since we no longer think China will become like us, it can only remain a totalitarian communist country, an enemy state implacably opposed to humane values. While one cannot but agree that China's actions internally sometimes deserve condemnation and its behavior abroad sometimes requires energetic containment on the part of America and its allies, We need to be aware that this great and ancient country harbors other visions for its future. And this is the trend that in the really sort of core of your American affairs piece, you describe in more detail with reference uh, to China's ancient history, and especially its cultural memory of the Qin dynasty and uh, the philosophy that is somewhat misleadingly called legalism. Um, Can you just sketch an outline for our listeners, the shift sort of away that you're identifying from Qin legalism, which is sort of reinvigorated by Mao toward this sort of new Confucianism? Yes, well, as I said in the American Affairs essay, uh, this is a kind of uh, archetypal story in Chinese history in the same way that the fall of the Roman Republic and the origins of the Roman Empire is an archetypal story. I once had my class do a research project in which they were to find out whether um, any American president had been accused of being Julius Caesar. <laughs> it turned <laughs> out that almost all of them had. I think he found George Washington and one other president who had not been accused by his political opponents of being Julius Caesar. Uh, and the same kind of archetypal cultural event happened in China in the transition from the Qin dynasty, which is the first United Dynasty, uh, Imperial Dynasty of China, which is in the uh, second century BC and uh, third second century BC, and uh, the um, and the Han Dynasty, because the Qin Dynasty united China 
uh, but only by using extremely um, rigorous methods that have been compared in, uh, to uh, Machiavellian political theory. And these are uh, methods that would be nowadays seen as cruel and tyrannical. Uh, but I think that's a misreading. In fact, the more I learn about legalism, the more I kind of like it a bit. <laughs> uh, but well, nevertheless, you know, the people who interpreted legalism for China are Confucian scholars who saw it as unremittingly evil because they themselves, the Confucian scholars, had been crushed by it. Uh, but the uh, the purpose of legalism is to set up a, a bureaucratic system which preserves the uh, or uh, promotes the wealth and the power of a state, and they are not too nice about how they get the wealth and power of the state. The the uh, morality usually takes a second second uh, place to uh, realism. I guess in modern in terms of modern IR, you call this an extremely really realistic point of view, but it was very cruel. The system it was hated by the people, and it only lasted fourteen years. That's the great the great uh, criticism of the Qin Dynasty that it was, it, yes, it unified China. Yes, it created the bureaucratic uh, nation state, or as we call it today, it's not nation is the wrong word, but an imperial uh, system, but a rational bureaucratic system. And it, and it abolished feudalism, but it was extremely in, in, in cruel and, and inhumane. And that's why it fell so rapidly. So the Han Dynasty scholars in later Confucian scholars who described the transition from the Qin to the Han said essentially that legalism was great for getting power, but not so good at preserving power. An important point, but, given what you've just said about that sort of Machiavellian, quasi Machiavellian idea that one of the most important things, right, is to maintain. Yeah, your but you, state. it's one thing to rule a country uh, or to get control of a country, it's nothing, another thing to get the people to accept that rule. And so the Confucians said that we are the we are the uh, culture. The culture of our our movement is the one that's going to help an emperor preserve his power through humane government. Because the people have to have to like their government. They have to accept their government as a morally good good government. Uh, and they're not, and the Qin couldn't couldn't establish that. So what you have in the Han Dynasty is a kind of combination of legalism and Confucianism. That they kept the structure. The legalist structure of China, the bureaucratic structure, but they then tried to introduce humane values through the study of Confucianism and through um, through uh, soulcraft, as I called in my my Renaissance book, uh, try, trying to c convert the uh, the ruling elites to some kind of humane, uh, virtuous uh, behavior, and they claim that 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 made those elites charismatic in some way that people wanted to obey them because they felt that their interests were being looked out for by people who cared about them. Okay. So uh, in, in Chinese imperial history, the Confucian scholars, they've been up and they've been down, but basically since the Song Dynasty, well, late Tang Song Dynasty, Confucians have been in, in the driver's seat in, in the bureaucratic structures of China. And that only came to an end in 1905 with the end of the examination system in China during the late, very late Qing dynasty. So when Mao comes on the scene, Ma Mao is a great admirer of legalism. He doesn't like all this. He, he, a lot of the uh, early republic, not just the communists, but also the early republicans, Sun Yat-sen, thought that Confucianism was, uh, was uh, medieval. As we would say, does, does Mao did Mao admire legalism for some of the same reasons you're coming to, or or was there a different? Oh, oh yes, I mean he wrote his thesis on the on the first uh, <laughs> Qin uh, ruler, uh, who was very he was very fond of him, and uh, he is he is explicitly embraces legalism as a political philosophy, uh, which is surprising because you would think he'd also remember the fact that the Qin didn't last very long, right? Uh, and the Communist Party has been around for seventy years. But there's a lot of people today who think that its way of ruling, it's, uh, uh, it, it's uh, what we would say in the West is tyrannical way of ruling, uh, can't last too much longer. And it has to convert itself somehow to something more, more humane. And there are many people in China uh, who look back to the Confucian past and see it in entirely different colors. In the early, in, in the 20th century, Confucianism was mostly seen by 
by uh, Chinese intellectuals and, and uh, leaders as something uh, to be left behind. It was uh, pre-modern, it was anti-scientific, it was too literary, didn't pay any attention to social science. And uh, they thought it was, it was also kind of corrupt and selfish. So nowadays people are looking back to Confucianism and seeing that it's, its good side and they're longing for some kind of moral leadership. And they're also, I think, longing in China for uh, respect from the outside world. And many Chinese thinkers and even ordinary Chinese understand that they're proud of China. I don't wanna say they're not patriotic. They're proud of China and China's achievements, but they also aware that its government is not loved. It doesn't attract a lot of respect internationally. And they, of course, themselves experience some of its tyrannical sides, especially with the social credit system and things like that. And the, the CCP is extremely vigorous in defending its own interests, and that leads to a lot of peremptory behavior. It's not very tolerant. It doesn't like hear any word of freedom. They try to shut down anybody who opposes CCP and its policies. And people understand in China many people understand in China that that's not an optimal situation. They want to transition to something that's a little more humane. Um, now, in the West, I mean, especially on the right in the US, people feel, many people on the right think that we're in a new Cold War and nothing will satisfy them unless, except the complete collapse of the CCP, a color revolution or a collapse like the Soviet Union, the CP, CP will be thrown out and liberal democracy has to be put in its place. So my argument in both of these pieces you're talking about is that this may not be the best way to achieve benign change in China, right? The China right. has its own deep traditions. Uh, liberal democracy works for the West and I love liberal democracy. I want to keep liberal democracy. I think it works very sure. well in our, our part of the world, but it may not be the best alternative for China. and. And it's partly it's this question of pride that the Chinese do not want to simply adopt Western values. They've had them, they, they have that long memory going back to the 19th century of Western countries trying to impose their religion and their political values on China. And the Chinese aren't 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 as, as welcoming to that idea anymore. But they are they do want change. And I think that the way that they want to change is something that's more in line with ancient Chinese traditions. Hmm. So you have this paradox, which uh, my, my friend Daniel Bell has talked about. They, they're, they are progressive traditionalists, which I mean, oxymoron in the right. West. You're either professional or pro progressive or a traditionalist, but there are many people in China, not just Daniel Bell and, and his followers, but uh, other Chinese political theorists at the time of our time, who think that the way to progress in China is to be more traditional. Hmm. Indeed, this is something, I mean, Douglas Murray makes this point about Europe, but it applies here, I think, as well, in a very big way, that it, it, Americans can have a hard time kind of accessing these subtler points of, of foreign countries' histories and uh, ideological conflicts simply because they kind of thwart, as you say, our prepackaged binaries, progressive versus traditional, uh, you know, liberalism versus communism, these sorts of things seem ironclad to us, but from the point of view of sort of internal Chinese affairs, maybe not so much. I, I wanted to read just one quick portion from this American affairs piece to ask you first about this as a, as a Chinese phenomenon before we sort of turn to how Americans regard and should regard or are likely to regard all of this. You note that the CCP, you say, after initial, initial suspicions, the CCP has gradually warmed to the Confucian approach to political reform. Confucian moral and political traditions were openly embraced and encouraged under Hu Jintao, who made Confucius the public face of China abroad by establishing the first Confucius Institutes. And you sort of continue in this vein, but then you say it would, it would be a mistake, however, to read political Confucianism or advocacy of political meritocracy as simply another arm of China's soft power campaign. Interest in Confucian political theory goes well beyond the mainland for one thing, and participants in the movement can be found in Hong Kong, Vietnam, South Korea, Singapore, and the United States. Popular Confucian movements have arisen in China 
among overseas Chinese communities with little support from the CCP. This is another thing that would raise eyebrows, I think, for those who come to this, assuming that there's no such thing as an interaction between or collaboration between the Chinese people and the Chinese Communist Party. I, I wanted to know more about what to what do you attribute this? It's almost a high-low coalition or a you know movement that seems both to have a grassroots element uh, and organically emerge out of uh, sort of longing for a softer a, a softer approach, but also to have won some support among uh, CCP leadership. What do you attribute that to? Well, we had it's some, somewhat similar to what happened in the Soviet Union after the collapse of communist regime there, there, there was a very great, I think, more, a sense of moral vacuum, right? That, mm. that the, not too many people by the end of the Soviet Union really bought into the whole communist, um, communist ideology, but nevertheless, they hadn't anything to replace it with. There was a revival of Orthodox Christianity, of course, in Russia. And in China, there's been revivals of, of religion as well, uh, Buddhism in particular, but also Christianity. Some estimates there are over 100 million Christians in China. I'm not sure I believe that, but there's certainly a lot of interest in, in religion. But the religion of ordinary Chinese before the disasters of the 20th century was deeply Confucian. And you can find uh, in Hong Kong, for example, people who practice Confucianism as a, at a kind of uh, local religious level, there are Confucian temples you can go to. Uh, I know a political theorist in Hong Kong who was brought up as a Confucian. In fact, uh, they went to temple, they did the ancestor worship, uh, they did the rites. So it does. It was it was stamped out in China, but in Hong Kong and other overseas Chinese communities, there, it, it survives, and there is a movement in China today which is not, as far as I can tell, under the control of, of the government. At least they try very hard to, to maintain. I think it's true. I've actually visited some of their schools and so on. That they, they want to bring Confucianism back to China at a kind of um, local level. So they have little schools that have opened up all over the country. There are thousands of these small Chinese Confucian academies all over China that have been uh, started by various sages, wise men, mm -hmm. they would never call themselves sages, but they're, they're, they're uh, uh, people who are kind of charismatic Chinese con uh, uh, Confucian teachers. For a long time, they were looked at askance by the regime, but since the 2000s, they've been treated more in a more friendly way. Uh, and for a long time, they had these underground um, tapes and CDs that would circulate around and the, the lecturer would introduce people to Confucian values. They would meet in the back of, uh, in back of um, you know, uh, businesses or in after school groups, or sometimes they met in Buddhist temples, which allowed, which are not exclusivists, so they allowed Confucians to meet there too. Uh, so there's a kind of popular Confucianism and of course, the state uh, is also now promoting Confucianism. Even Xi Jinping gives, uh, I think it's more than lip service. He, 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 he believes in, the, in, the, in Confucian values. Although with the Communist Party, you're always, uh, you're always um, suspicious that it's being used to, to, to strengthen their own position. But right. Chinese textbooks uh, and junior high and uh, middle school, as we say, and high school are often full of Confucian sayings and Mencius and Shunsa and the great Confucian thinkers. They're, they're, they memorize them in school. They teach it uh, uh, as a kind of civic, um, a civic uh, religion. So it's it's deeper than political theory. Theory is what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say. There are political right. theorists, and very interesting discussion among political theorists as to what the political implications are of Confucianism. Uh, so the mainland Chinese often believe that Confucianism must go together with monarchy, at least at the highest levels of the government. Whereas in Hong Kong, for example, you're more likely like someone like Joseph Chan, for example, who's a Professor at the University of Hong Kong, he's more likely to say uh, that Confucianism is compatible with a liberal democracy up to a point. So mm -hmm. there's that sort of discussion. So I, I, I don't, I, what I'm trying to avoid is the, the conclusion that many people have made, 
that modern Confucian political theory, political Confucianism in particular, is a is the ideology of the Chinese Communist Party, which it's not. Hmm. Uh, it's a movement that's trying to um, humanize Chinese government, but it's also trying to convert and to moralize Chinese society to return it to its its typical values of of, of uh, respect for proper relations in society, for 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 filial piety, and for for uh, respect for for the Tao and uh, for morality and proper relations among human beings, right? In in just the uh, time that remains to us now, I, I'd like to sort of pivot to an American perspective because I think you've identified correctly a sort of common thread of China analysis on the right, which I would I think you know many conservatives would hear the way that you describe Confucianism and uh, just co-sign a great deal of it, feel not along as you talk about these traditional values of of the family and even and even in some cases of, of hierarchy. On the other hand, much of this is sort of unknown to the general public, this sort of deeper history that you're describing. And we look overseas and see, you know, still liberalizing trends aside, right? You see really appalling or, or terrifying abuses of power to which you allude at the end of your CRB piece. We, we you know, everybody, the whole world watched what happened in Hong Kong in, in 2019. And, and that, I think, is kind of indelibly stamped on our minds. So it's it's difficult, I think, to persuade China hawks um, that there's there's kind of anything, any possibility for reform of the CCP. While at the same time, you know, we're under an administration which seems to kind of take the opposite tack. Just before we're about to record, um, Biden says that, that there's no longer a bright line between foreign and domestic policy, and to push back against authoritarianism effectively, the U.S. must make racial equality a whole of government effort. So we have, you know, this this sort of, I think, very, very unappealing public face of China, combined with a weird kind of religion of, of racial purity in America that has nothing to do with China. What What are we to make of all this in light of the kind of deeper and more complex issues that you've raised within China from a point of view of uh, U.S. policy? Do you see the future of, of U.S. policy toward China as, as as being hopeful or what what would be the right tack for us to take here? Um, whole of government, maybe I should explain is this idea that the government has to set priorities in uh not just um, government policy, but also economic policy, diplomatic relations, media, policing, military policy, all has to be focused on particular objectives. So I think the whole of government approach goes back to maybe, I think it's Tony Blair who invented that in the 1990s. But anyway, this is said to be the standard approach in China. The Chinese are much smarter, much more uh, much more focused than we are, much more goal-driven. And Goldman says that our, our free economy puts us at a disadvantage. Uh, we're still the most uh, in innovative, inventive people in the world, but we're not focusing our efforts on the international struggle uh, for priority between China and the U.S. Uh, so we have to take a whole government approach. And this, I think, is, has been picked up by the uh, Biden administration, which has pretty much returned to the, the kind of multilateral internationalist uh, views of the Obama administration, uh, which tries to tries to use uh, a, a um, devotion to liberal democracy as our uh, ideological weapon in the battle against China. So my view of this is that we, we shouldn't be hankering for a new Cold War. I'm against a new Cold War. <laughs> um, you know, Neil Ferguson out in California has been saying for some time that we're in Cold War II, and he says it's not our fault. The Chinese are, are, are starting the Cold War II. They're the regime that wants to dominate the world, uh, or at least to uh, be the number one power in the world, and they're the one who's engaging in the whole government approach. Uh, and they're forcing us into that because we don't want to lose in, in the competition. And then, of course, there's this uh, this um, realist view that was put about by Graham Allison at, at I don't want to say he's at Harvard. He, he's connected with the Kennedy School. He's actually at Wellesley, but he, he likes to say he's from Harvard. 
Uh, I guess you've heard of the Thucydides trap. This is oh, sure. one of the um, things that has mesmerized American foreign policy people. And in the view of Graham Allison, Thucydides uh, uh, says that when there is a conflict between a, a declining power and a rising power, uh, there's going to be a, a um, there's going to be a bust up sooner or later. Um, and it's better to it for the declining power to attack earlier rather than later because uh, it has a better chance of, of winning. So this is, uh, first of all, a terrible reading of Thucydides. <laughs> but, 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 but second of all, it's, it's giving it's right, this kind of realist view that we have to push back vigorously now against the Chinese or we will lose in some sort of international competition. Uh, and I think that the Biden administration uh, um, is not... Um, fully on board with that, but they, they clearly think, it's clearly taking much more seriously the threat of China than, than uh, Obama did even five, things have changed a lot in the last five years, as I point out in the essay, and that most of the Washington elites now accept the fact that we are in competition and the competition is being driven by the Chinese themselves. Um, but I, I would say, uh, I would add the caveat that we're not actually in a cold war. It's not, this is not like the contest with the Soviet Union. Uh, the Chinese regime uh, often behaves in tyrannical ways, uh, but they're not trying to export their type of tyranny to us. They've been very unsuccessful in supporting and exporting the Chinese uh, way. And in, and in another sense, they don't have to export tyranny to us because we're imposing it on ourselves uh, through extreme progressive uh, wokeness. Uh, we're embracing our own form of tyranny. We don't need the Chinese kind. Um, <laughs> and both China and America have mixed mixed econo economies. There's a large element of government uh, participation and a certain amount of economic freedom. Uh, so the Chinese are not really a threat to our economic system the way that the, the communists in China and uh, the Soviet Union were, but they are an economic rival. And we have to look out for ourselves. Uh, we have to um, we have to uh, sustain our, 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 our alliances. We have to guarantee the free, free trade and, free, and maritime freedom around the world. Those things we have to do. Uh, but that doesn't mean we need to get into some sort of um, Cold War, uh, especially a militarized Cold War uh, with the Chinese. There have been some scenarios, I think, it wasn't Alson, but um, someone recently published a, a scenario where we got into a, a war with China. I think Alson has one of these scenarios actually in his book where we essentially lose. I'm not sure that that would actually happen. I think if the, the trigger point's always thought to be Taiwan, the Chinese might invade Taiwan. Hmm. But I think if they did that, they would not, they might eventually win, but I think it would be a very, very costly victory, which would cost them the rest of their, you know, that it would, it would probably bring down the government for one thing, because it would be, uh, lead to massive damage to, to the Chinese mainland itself. Uh, the Taiwanese have been preparing to defend themselves for the last you know, 70 years, basically, and they, they will. Uh, the Chinese will not be able to roll, roll, roll Taiwan very easily. So um, I, I don't think we're in a Cold War situation. And I, I, I think it's probably what I would like to see is a little more respect for the Chinese tradition, the Chinese attempts to uh, liberalize themselves, liberalize in, in the Chinese sense, I mean, become more Confucian. And uh, this is this is something that non-historians constantly uh, mistake. They non-historians tend to, especially political theorists, tend to fit people into categories and then say that they will behave according to those categories. Hmm. Whereas historians are are more interested in the dynamic side of history. Right? We uh, understand that China was one thing under Mao, and it's another thing under Deng Xiaoping, and it's another thing again under Xi Jinping. Uh, and there are trends that, that can be encouraged and trends that should be discouraged. We can't really do that much about China's internal development, but we can um, we can defend our own interests, defend our own our own uh, values. Mm -hmm. That's a profound insight. That uh, sort of prescribing China's path on the basis of our theories about its 
sort of place in, in political philosophy is probably unlikely to give us the, the most sophisticated approach. Um, I'm talking today to Professor James Hankins of Harvard. Uh, his latest book is Virtue Politics, Soulcraft and Statecraft in Renaissance Italy. We've got two pieces, What Kind of Realism Toward China in the CRB and Regime Change with Chinese Characteristics in American Affairs. Uh, once more, our listeners can find the latest Claremont Review of Books and subscribe at claremontreviewofbooks.com and donate at claremont.org slash donate. I thank you very much once again, Jim, for, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure.